Uh, my name is Bing Hao Wang. We have a nice session tonight. So I will first introduce myself a little bit. Uh, I'm a professor of Southeast University. In the last decade, I have been working on flexible transistors and the wearable sensors. Now my current group aims to develop and integrate ultra-thin and ultra-flexible transistors and the sensors that come from conformal interfaces with uh, soft biological tissues. Together with advanced circuits and uh, algorithms, we exploit this diverse system as tools to understand the fundamental science of um, technical challenges and explore applications in human health monitoring to uh, create a better society. For this session, uh, we are going to focus on advanced biomedical application technologies. And uh, uh, because I think this is really a cutting edge field that would change our future healthy life in uh, invasive ways. I feel very honored to have the two speakers today, as both are outstanding young researchers in their respective fields. Also, we have two panelists, one is from Peking University and one is from uh, UGST. They will join the discussion part of the talks. And so I think it is an amazing opportunity for us to invite them to show their interesting work. Our first speaker is Associate Professor Vincent Salas from the University of Lea. Um, he received his PhD degree from the University of Limoges, followed by two years postdoc works at the University of Lea. Currently, she, uh, no, sorry, he is a visiting researcher at the U Tokyo of Japan. So he is kind of my uh, schoolmate, actually. Today, he is going to introduce the various 3D printing techniques. Then, he will focus on direct rider electro spinning to prepare 3D micro structured scaffolds for new implants and individual models. And I would like, would like to give to Vincent and look forward to his talk. Vincent, stop, uh, stop my sharing. I cannot hear you, Vincent. Yeah. Sorry, it's better with the microphone on. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Ah. Can you see my screen now? Yes, thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much for this kind of introduction. So, uh, yes, I'm uh, Vincent Sal. Actually, I'm currently in uh, the University of Tokyo, but uh, as you said, um, belonging to the University of Lyon 1 in France. So today I would like to speak about um, just a topic which is related to direct right electro spinning. So the title is a highly resolved resolvable scaffolds for biomedical applications. And um, this is related to what I've done in the past. And it's also related what, uh, on, uh, to what I'm doing now uh, in Tokyo. So this is uh, the out outline of um, this talk. So first, I want to come back to the challenges of uh, biomedical applications. Uh, then I will make the link between uh, tissue engineering and 3D printing. And among the different 3D printing techniques we can use, I will really focus on the direct right electro spinning uh, technique, which is uh, very interesting, you will see. And uh, I will give you one uh, example from our research applied to dental application. And uh, then I will conclude and give uh, some future orientations. So first, um, when we think about uh, biomedical applications, if we uh, just look what is done or what is required to do uh, in the world, if, if you look at the uh, United Nations, uh, so there are 17 goals which has been uh, which have been uh, proposed 
as sustainable goals uh, development. So one of these ones are the third one uh, to make good health and well-being. Uh, so the idea is to give the opportunity to all the, the, the all the people in this world to have uh, essential healthcare services and access to safe, effective, quality, and affordable essential medicines and vaccines. So uh, the idea is uh, we know that everybody can be exposed to diseases and accidents. So the idea is to be able to develop um, suitable diagnostics and also treatments. So in this story, we can think about implants. And in the implants, you have two uh, subcategories. One is uh, related to inorganic implants, like uh, hip implants here or dental implants. And uh, another kind of implants is uh, implantable tissues. So this is really related to what we call uh, tissue engineering. Uh, and what you can hear also and see in the state of the art lab on chip and biofabrication. Uh, so regarding, regarding the current and the future challenges in tissue engineering, uh, one of the most important things is to be able to make very uh, uh, specific parts of organs in the future. So the idea is to make thick tissues, uh, so in three dimensions, and uh, that could be implanted into the patient. So the idea is also to have uh, structures mimicking real tissues. Uh, so I'm talking about making some model, uh, in vitro models, in order to be able to help to better understand uh, the onset of diseases. This is a, a second um, uh, strategy, uh, which is interesting to develop uh, in vitro um, tissue engineering. So the hurdles to overcome are uh, related to be able to organize and uh, position different kinds of cells. Because if you take into account the, only the, the few uh, organs I put here, heart, kidney, spleen, brain, liver, they are all structured differently. Of course, we, we can find uh, blood, blood vessels in all these organs, but uh, the kind of uh, cells we can meet in inside each organ is not the same uh, and the organization of the cells uh, is really different so we have to find a way a technique uh, or maybe combine different techniques in order to be able to make these complex uh, structures so um, for that 3d printing could be very uh, interesting uh, just uh, I mean, before talking about 3D printing in details, when you talk about uh, making materials, uh, it can be scaffolds, but also uh, other kinds of materials, you can think about different processes to fabricate these materials. And usually people can use uh, machining and also molding. But if you want to make uh, complex structures in 3D, maybe this approach is not really, uh, these approaches are not really uh, wishable. So additive manufacturing was really um, uh, was really uh, adapted uh, theoretically uh, to make these complex structures. So why? Because we can make 3D objects uh, quite complex uh, with, a, I would say, a high speed of fabrication, depending on the technique you are using, uh, different designs and sizes and um, with a cost which is as low as possible. But the, regarding the cost, uh, this is uh, really discussing when, uh, when we talk about different, uh, some techniques of 3D printing. Uh, but anyway, it's a layer by layer approach. Uh, so we can organize the structure as we want. So this is the overall uh, uh, strategy to make an object by 3D printing, whatever the technique we choose. So at first we have an object that we can uh, uh, just design with a software or we can scan. And then we make a, a file, which is a STL file. And from this file, we can just make slices in order to determine the different coordinates, 
and the different parameters of uh, the printing. So we make what we call a G-code. And from this G-code, we fabricate uh, the object. Then we remove the object from the printer. And eventually, we make some uh, post-processing, like uh, polishing, washing, uh, painting, uh, different depends on what we want to do afterwards. And finally, we have the functional objects we want to use. So uh, I don't want to read this table in details, but just to give you an idea of uh, the different kinds of uh, techniques, uh, most famous techniques we can meet uh, for 3D printing or additive manufacturing, we can use both terms. Uh, if we are talking about the resolution um, here, uh, the highest resolution we can uh, have is corresponding to the multi-photon lithography. So it can be two photon and three photon now a lithography. This is very, very, very resolved, but resolved technique. But uh, it's really hard to make big objects. Uh, and it's really, really uh, time consuming to make uh, one object. Uh, if you want to go uh, above the micrometer scale. So it's very interesting in terms of resolution, but it's really limited in terms of the size of the object. Uh, so if we think about uh, biology, here you have on, on, the, on this schematic uh, different biological objects uh, from the molecule, for instance, to here it's just frog egg at the millimeter scale. And uh, viruses are of about 100 uh, nanometer. Then you have bacteria around the micro scale and also um, cells uh, around tens of microns. And neurons are very specific cells because you have the cell itself, it's uh, of about 10 microns, but the axons can be uh, uh, as long as the centimeter or even tens of centimeters. So um, for biofabrication, it's very important to uh, I would say, uh, be aware of uh, the accuracy or the resolution of the object we can fabricate. For instance, if we want to have an interaction between the object and the cell, we it's very important to have um, uh, the resolution, which is of about the size of the object we want to interact with, uh, meaning the, the cell. So if you consider the, the conventional um, uh, additive manufacturing techniques like uh, fused deposition modeling, powder-based uh, fusion, or uh, selective laser sintering. Uh, the resolution we can reach is of about at least tens of microns, and the size of the object can be, of course, very, very big. On the opposite, we have the two-photon and three-photon stereolithography uh, with objects we can reach up to the micro, micro scale or the millimeter scale if you really want to spend time to print the object. So in between, uh, there was no, not really uh, any specific technique um, uh, which was developed in the past. And uh, the idea was to really work in this gap and to be able to have a good resolution at the micro scale and to fabricate objects at the centimeter scale for uh, scaffolds, uh, like uh, scaffolds to make implants. So in the past years, uh, more than 15 years ago, uh, uh, regarding the printing uh, resolution, uh, the team of Jennifer Lewis uh, in the United States uh, made a good job uh, with some polymers and even with a titania just by extruding a specific material from a nozzle, like uh, here on this schematic. Uh, so it was a combination of 3D printing and extrusion or spinning. Uh, more recently, Paul Dalton uh, developed with uh, his colleagues um, melt electrospinning uh, by combining this, electros this kind of electrospinning with 3D printing. And uh, this is called melt electro writing. And uh, they published very nice results and even a good paper here um, with a grid, which was thick, uh, filled with a hydrogel 
in order to replace or to regenerate a cartilage. It was uh, a very nice paper. So from these results, uh, in our case, we were interested in keeping the very uh, small size of the filament or the object we were printing. So the, the filaments of about several tens of uh, uh, hundreds of nanometers to 10 uh, micrometers in order to stay in the, in the range of the size of the cells and to be able to, to uh, print uh, quite uh, rapidly the object. And also we wanted to be able to insert some um, uh, biomolecules or other kinds of fillers inside the material in order to release uh, these fillers with time and to have an impact on the tissue we wanted to grow around. Uh, so we decided to work on direct, uh, direct right electrospinning using uh, solutions. So uh, now I want to focus more on this technique, of course. And just before, I want to come back uh, to what is electrospinning and what we can do with this technique. So I'm sure that uh, most of you uh, are really aware uh, of what is electrospinning, but just uh, as a reminder, maybe. Uh, so we use a, a polymer which can be dissolved in a solvent or just melt. Then we um, press, uh, we push this polymer through a nozzle. This nozzle can be just a single uh, needle. It can be also a coaxial needle. We can also put uh, several uh, needles in parallel. And uh, once we apply the voltage at the needle tip, of course, there are some uh, restrictions regarding the solution, but I don't want to come back to these details. When we apply the voltage, we can stretch the solution into a, uh, a tiny filament, which is continuously stretched toward uh, the target. So we can uh, make uh, aligned or organized uh, filaments and also randomly oriented uh, filaments, depending on what we have uh, as a collector. So usually we have a whipping effect. Uh, so here you have on the left hand side uh, the nozzle. Uh, on the right hand side you have the collector. So this whipping effect is uh, due to uh, the location of the, the electrical charges at the interface between the jet and the air. So if we want to make a precise pattern, you have to uh, get rid of this uh, whipping effect. So we can do it by playing with the rheology of the solution to have a straight trajectory of the jet between the needle tip and the collector. And we can also increase the accuracy of the deposition by decreasing the working distance between the needle tip and the collector. So these images are really one the, the ones we obtained when we started to work with this technique. So at that time, we were adapting uh, both the machine and also the rheology. And uh, it was nice to put these images uh, just to tell you uh, this story. So now uh, I want to focus on a specific uh, example, uh, which is related to one object we had when I was in Lyon and related to dental application. So, um, the periodontitis is a, a parodontal disease. It's also called gum disease. And uh, this uh, disease is um, uh, really visible for dentists uh, here. You have a cavity which appears between the root of the, of the teeth and the bone, the uh, alveolar bone. Uh, so usually you have the the root, which is attached to the bone through uh, periodontal ligaments here. But once you have periodontitis, uh, you have a loss of uh, tissues here. And uh, if it's really, really, uh, a really, really serious infection, you can even uh, have a loss of teeth. So uh, it's very important to treat uh, and to heal uh, the tissues. So what we proposed in this project is to make a hybrid material with a two uh, bifunctional material with one side uh, functionalized in order to regenerate the tissues 
which are really uh, along the root of the teeth. It's called the cement. And uh, to also regenerate the bone, which is on the opposite side. So how to do it? Uh, by making a porous material in order to um, allow the cells to migrate inside uh, the scaffold and also to uh, allow the cells to differentiate uh, into cementoblasts and also osteoblasts. So for that, we put a protein, a specific protein, which is called CMP1, which normally helps fibroblasts, which are naturally present in the, in the mouth, in the, in the tooth environment, to differentiate into cementoblasts. And we also use hydroxyapatite nanoparticles. So hydroxyapatite has the natural composition of bone. And these particles are uh, known to help fibroblasts differentiate into osteoblasts. So this is the, the, the story. And uh, this is a quite short video in order to present you uh, the work. Uh, the whole process. So first we prepare two solutions, one containing the protein, as you see here, another one containing uh, the hydroxyapatite particles. Then we just sample the solutions into syringes. Then we connect the syringes to needles. We position uh, the syringe and the needle into a syringe pump here in the machine. In this machine, we are able to, to control the humidity. It's very important. Then we connect a high voltage supply to the needle tip. And of course, we have a specific G code in order to control the pattern we want to make. And then we stretch the solution with a high voltage uh, applied between the spin rate and the collector. And then we move the stage uh, in order to, uh, to make our pattern. So we can use one needle we can use also another one or a third one depending on the number of um, functionalities we want to bring to the scaffold so once we have fabricated this scaffold we are able to detach the scaffold to cut it with the dimensions we want then we sterilize <coughs> the scaffolds and we make the cultivation so the spheres you see here on the, this animation are uh, representing cells. So we see the cells on the scaffold. And the idea is the cells are going to, to be in contact with the scaffold. And here you see uh, two different colors, a yellow one and pink one representing uh, part containing HNP and the other one containing CMP1. So this is just the, the dream we had at the beginning to have a full differentiation of the cells on each part of the scaffold, then proliferation. And uh, at the end, uh, we also have the PCR, the, the, the polymer, sorry, which uh, resolves. So um, this was, uh, yes, the story. We decided to work with different polymers like PLGA, polylactic coglyconic acid. Uh, this polymer is quite, uh, is quite um, uh, nice because we can play on the resorption time depending on the ratio between the lactic and the glycolic uh, parts. And we also wanted to use polycaprolactin because it's very interesting in terms of mechanical um, properties, even if the resorption time is longer than PLGA polymers. So we use uh, um, an organic solvent to make the solutions. Uh, so as you can imagine, we have different process parameters like voltage, the distance between the needle tip and the collector, the feed rate, the speed of the stage, the humidity. It's very important to control it because it, it has a, a huge impact on the reproducibility of the uh, experiments. So by monitoring uh, the different uh, patterns we want to make, uh, by the way, we used um, a free app that you can also use if you keep this link uh, in mind. It's, uh, it has been developed by a, a colleague of mine in Emion. So we can design uh, the G codes and then we can print. This is just an overview of very basic um, uh, prints we can do. Uh, 
what is interesting here is to see the, the accuracy of the position about the micro scale, uh, the thickness is the thickness of the walls you can print uh, from tens of uh, hundreds of nanometers to the micro scale, and the the size of the objects we can print. So the thickness is of about the millimeter scale if we want, or a few millimeters, and the size is of about several. It can be several tens of uh, square centimeters. So here are the printed uh, architectures. So I told you that we wanted to use uh, a B-functional or hybrid uh, material with uh, two functionalities. So we put on one side uh, uh, hydroxyapatite nanoparticles. So the printing was uh, very good. We so uh, here that we had the nanoparticles with um, by playing with the percentage of the particles, we saw that with the uh, thirty percent in weight of particles in the polymer, we were able to have a lot of particles at the surface of the polymer of the filaments. So it's very important to have a, a good interaction with the cells. We also uh, just evidenced this. Uh, with the FTIR. Uh, regarding the CMP1, there is a long story behind this, but just to uh, summarize, we used a coaxial uh, printing in order to uh, prevent the, the protein to be in contact um, with the organic solvent. So we put here a so, uh, aqueous solution of protein with a polyethylene dipole, and around it was a solution with a polycaprolactone in the organic solvent. So here we saw that the printing accuracy was not as good as expected because uh, actually the protein has a huge impact on the on the jet quality during the spinning. But anyway, it worked. And um, we just checked with BSA, which is another protein, but cheaper than CMP1, that uh, we had the release of the protein um, starting from the first days uh, after incubation and uh, over the two first weeks. So it's very interesting to know that the protein can be released quite uh, fast and uh, also over time. And uh, so these two structures were uh, prepared uh, individually. And then we, of course, prepared the by uh, B-functional scaffold. For this last structure, just to give you uh, some uh, pictures. So here we have the hydroxyapatite particles inserted into the PCL, and here below it's uh, with the CMP1. So it's not very nice with the CMP1, but we you will see just after that it does not have any impact on the on the quality of the biological samples. So here, just to give you um, a, a, a higher resolution image by SEM, you see the quality of the walls we can fabricate, and not really with the protein, but with the uh, hydroxyapatite particles or uh, without, it's possible to have very nice walls. So regarding the biological assays, as I told you at the beginning, the idea is to implant the material uh, and uh, to use the patient's cells. So the cells we can find into the um, around the teeth are uh, periodontal ligament cells, PDL cells. So the idea was to use also the same cells in our study. So uh, briefly for the two kinds of samples, so with HAP and with CMP1, we checked that the metabolic activity of the cells were, was quite similar. Uh, with the scaffold and without, and it was roughly uh, the case. And uh, we were really happy to see that uh, with uh, HAP, but even with CMP1, we had uh, a high amount of calcium uh, inside the cells uh, after a few days. So that means we had a mineralization of the tissues of the cells of so the tissue around the scaffold after a few days. And uh, we saw with immunostaining after day 18 that 
Here in this case with HAP, the grid was full of cells and they were healthy. And uh, with CMP1, we had also a lot of cells everywhere in the scaffold. So here you see the pink color, it's because it's a combination of blue with the nuclei and uh, uh, also the red, uh, which is due to the uh, osteocontin. And the green is related to the actin filaments, so that means it's just the membrane of the cells. So in this study, we uh, were not able to work on the differentiation, so uh, it's just a perspective for this work, but uh, I think uh, now I can conclude. Um, yes. So, um, yes, I, did, I just explained you what is uh, direct right electrospinning and what is the, what can be the interest of this technique uh, in the world of uh, biofabrication. Uh, it's a very uh, resolved uh, technique. Uh, we can print quite fast uh, the samples. And uh, yes, the, the, the filament we can fabricate is very tiny. Uh, and one of the most uh, also important things is that we can make gradients or multifunctional um, scaffolds. So I just show you this uh, through the example of um, uh, this project for periodontal regeneration. I don't want to come back on it. Uh, just uh, regarding future orientations. So I'm now working on. Uh, just an extended project uh, compared to the one I just showed you. Uh, so now I work on in vitro, uh, on the design of in vitro complex and vascularized tissues here in Tokyo by collaborating with professors working on vascularization on uh, IPS cells as well. And uh, just maybe to share uh, um, idea with you it's not an idea for me it's really something and i really take into account now uh, at the beginning i told you that um, uh, this pro this work was uh, implemented uh, in this goal of good health and uh, well-being but actually these goals are not really isolated uh, from each other so uh, for my future projects uh, I really want to think about the processes and the materials I'm going to use in order to develop uh, new medical devices in order to think about the impact uh, of the research on the climate change and the env environmental uh, issues. So I think as researchers, it's very important to take into account in consideration uh these aspects as well so without with uh, that sorry i've finished i uh, just want to thank all my colleagues from the project uh in france uh, and also uh, the professor who is uh, hosting me here in tokyo uh Byung -Jung kim and my colleagues from the Lynx laboratory which is an international laboratory between the cnrs in france and the university of tokyo thank you very much Thank you, Vincent, for your last talk. Uh, we will have panel discussion in the end, and the, the question will follow. So uh, I will share my screen again. And then I will be going to have our next speaker. Uh, it's Mr. Fahim Hassan. He's currently a PhD student in the group of Professor Penjiang Yu at uh, Penn State University. Uh, I have been working with their group to develop highly stretchable transistor arrays, so I know very well with him. Uh, Fahim has published more than 20 papers in uh, top tier journals, like Nature Electronics, Nature Communications, and uh, Science Advances, etc. Uh, he was awarded the pre uh, prestigious NSF uh, Graduate Research Scholarship. His current research interest is in the development and applications of flexible stretchable electronics for wearable implantable health monitoring, uh, disease treatment, and tissue engineering. In this talk, uh, he will present the ultra-conformal 
US uh, join on skin by electronics platform include uh, different devices like uh, uh, symphonic transistors, strength sensors, temperature sensors, heaters, and hydration sensors, and uh, electrical physiological sensors. And it will, it will be a wonderful talk for him. The stage is yours now. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Let me share my screen. Okay, I think uh, my screen is live. Can you see it? Yes, okay. Look, it's good. All right, great. Um, Hi, everyone. Again, my name is Fahim Rashad. I am a six-year BME PhD in medical engineering, and I'm working under the guidance of Professor Kun Zheng Yu at Penn State University. I'd like to introduce you a, a new wearable bioelectronics platform called Drawn on Skin, or DOS Bioelectronics, for multifunctional ocean artifact-free sensing and point-of-care treatment. The wearable technologies are clearly ubiquitous today, and by wearable technologies, I mean uh, smartwatches, uh, fitness trackers, wearable brain monitoring headsets, VR technologies, or smart textiles, for example. Several existing reports on the wearable technology market uh, project an extremely optimistic future in the coming years and onwards. And this applies globally in both uh, developing and developing developed nations. In the next few years, this $100 billion market is expected to double with the number of sold units expected to increase by at least another billion. And it's clear to see that there is an increasing and widespread adaptation of wearable technology. With the growth of the wearable technology market, there's an enormous uh, collaborative effort to develop these technologies, especially for healthcare. So brain monitoring headsets, uh, smartwatches, fitness trackers, they tend to come in the form of rather bulky devices and they have rigid construction. And for the purpose of this talk, I'll refer to them as conventional wearables. These wearables aren't so ideal for the human body, which is you know, curved, soft, and dynamic. On the other hand, soft electronics, and I'll refer to these as wearable electronics for this talk, provide a seamless interface with the human body. Due to their low profile nature and similar mechanical characteristics to human skin, these types of electronics provide robust healthcare monitoring and treatment capabilities while also remaining imperceptible to the user. Soft electronics can be substantially better for use in healthcare compared to the rigid counterparts as they overcome the mechanical mismatch with the human body, don't prevent or hinder movement, and are compliant and comfortable for the users. So the current wearables are excellent for use in static conditions, but they're not so suited for dynamic condition. As we humans move, our skin deforms, but the sensors we attach to our bodies don't necessarily move with our skin. And in other words, there's some relative movement at the interface between the skin and sensors. And this can lead to misdiagnoses of otherwise healthy individuals, as well as unnecessary medical expenses or treatments. Now, others have tackled this problem using additional hardware and computation, but this problem of motion artifacts still remains as a longstanding challenge for wearables. Uh, recent developments in current wearable electronics have shown devices in the form of patches, but these patches have imperfect conformability or poor adhesion to the skin particularly during motion, which still results in motion artifacts. In addition to these conventional wearables and wearable electronics, clinical technologies are also still susceptible to motion. Now, there are a few sources of motion artifacts, and some of the more significant ones are listed here. For this work that I'm going to present, I'm going to focus on the artifacts developed due to relative motion at the skin electronics interface. So instead of taking the conventional fabrication approach, which involves making sensors in labs or factories and then attaching them to them, we decided to make sensors directly on the skin and call these drawn on skin DOS bioelectronics. Upon drawing, an ultra conformal, robust, and stretchable interface that is immune to motion is formed between DOS electronics and skin. Compared to the existing wearable and or printed bioelectronics fabricated based on usually dedicated equipment, uh, DOS electronics has numerous advantages. Um, these might include uh, simple fabrication without using such dedicated equipment, um, the ability to deposit electronic materials on dynamic surfaces, 
capability to construct even active electronics, um, offering multifunctionality and on-demand customizability for personalized point of care treatment. But most importantly though, DOS Electronics offers immunity to motion artifacts without the need for additional hardware or computation, which again is an unprecedented solution to the long-standing challenge within the bioelectronics field. So here you can see the drawing process of DOS Electronics, just simple yet extremely useful for developing several types of sensors and devices. All of these uh, devices are based on combinations of our conductive ink on lakes and PSS, um, our semiconducting ink based on P3HT intervals, or dielectric ink based on an ionic gel. So to briefly go over uh, some of these inks, um, I'll start with the conductive ink. Here we show the components and a possible molecular arrangement of the materials within a drop of ink, schematic. Um, the shear thinning property from this curve uh, makes uh, clear that the DOS conductive ink can be um, used for printing or writing. Um, looking at the now micro nanostructure, um, looking at the SEM image here, we can see clearly the microstructure of the AD flakes, conductive ink. The FM image, we can actually see in a fibrils of the PSS. And clearly, um, the ink can fully conform to the rough and irregular surface of the skin. Um, the conductive ink shows low resistance, even when it is stretched. We also try to evaluate how compatible um, our inks are at multiple scales. So we started with the cellular scale, looking at cellular level biocompatibility of the ink. And here we show actually rat cardiomyocytes, uh, heart cells cultured with drawn on skin ink under different, uh, even without the typical matrix uh, fibronectin coating, um, still show that all of the conditions are actually similar in terms of cell viability. And primary cardiomyocytes can clearly grow on the surface of the DOS ink. Clearly, cell viability is high. And we did a similar experiment with primary neurons as well, and they show similar results too. Going on to the tissue level now, um, at the tissue level, uh, we observed no inflammatory reaction over the course of three days of wearing on the skin of mice. Uh, a pathologist uh, reviewed the histological stains and found no significant differences drawn on skin samples and control samples at each day. And at the skin level, on human skin, we didn't observe any irritation or redness after multiple times of drawing and bracing. Now, transitioning to the semiconducting ink, we use an organic semiconducting polymer that form nanofibril structures and clearly see these fiber structures in semi of the semiconducting ink image, which enables its stretchability. Whenever we mechanically perturbed the dried inks, we didn't see any obvious deliverable damage. And in addition, we didn't see any inflammatory response after 48 hours of exposure to them with mice. So transitioning now from the materials and devices, uh, we developed several drawn on skin devices on skin replica to through their functionality using the three types of inks and their appropriate stencils. Uh, the DOS transistor here was fabricated in minutes and remained functional even when stretched. It showed typical P type uh, transistor characteristics. Um, though the drawing process is fully manual, these results are quite promising and show that the drawing process can be used to develop functional and stretchable drawn on skin transistors as a proof of concept. Eventually, these drawn on DOS transistors in readout application, uh, signal, signal amplification, or uh, integrated circuits. Strain sensors and temperature sensors, again, which reveal critical physiological information in the skin, were drawn in the format of two terminal sensors. And the strain sensors show a good sensitivity, the pH factor of 15. The sensitivity of the drawn skin temperature sensor was comparable to that of commercial thermistors. Now transitioning into uh, devices which we on, drew on actual skin, on porcine. And... So starting at the top here, uh, the DOS heater here uh, works quite well. The conductive ink serves as a clear uh, conducting pathway to heat here. Um, in addition, we show that we can use this conductive ink as an interconnection. Um, we constructed a basic RC circuit, and uh, we store a charge from a battery, eventually after removing the power supply battery, we can charge. And to showcase uh, the DOS electronics capability for medical usage, we developed a skin hydration sensor to measure the distance 
We found that the sensor performance is linearly related to that of a commercial meter, and even when these sensors are touched, uh, still remains functional. We then utilized our conductive ink to electrophysiological or EP sensors. So here you can see that the DOS EP sensors show good signal quality, uh, even when stretched, usually capture both E and um, One relevant clinical application for the stress tests. So uh, these are typically done in the hospital, uh, used to evaluate heart condition. We developed a, a Bluetooth-based data transmission circuit uh, with some off-the-shelf components to interface with our drawn on screen sensors. Um, and you can clearly see here as the subject rests, the heart rate decreases, whereas the cure decreases, whereas when they walk, the heart rate increases. So to, to determine the uh, advantages and the benefits of DOS EP sensors amongst the existing sensor technologies, we compared them to both the hospital grade gel electrodes and the sensor mesh electrodes that are well established in the flexible and stretchable electronics. So here we look at the signals before and during sweating. So looking at the before sweating, they all look quite comparable um, and relatively consistent. Uh, during sweating or the drawn on skin and Mesh electrodes, but for the gel electrodes, clearly the signal, which is diluted gel electrolyte. Also, the signals attained with the DOS EP sensors were relatively consistent over a seven hour period. Others. So, compare the uh, adhesion, we did a qualitative test by attaching tape to the sensors and removing it. The gel from the gel electrodes, mesh electrodes were easily removed and shows the relatively adhesion. Uh, the gel electrodes do have an ad additional adhesive, um, which helps secure them to the skin, but it doesn't necessarily prevent motion artifacts. Um, the dust sensors, however, remain pretty much intact after the When we actually physically try to damage them, um, we show that after rubbing, dust sensors show relatively minimal damage, whereas the mesh sensors are actually irreversibly damaged. Um, and if damaged, the DOS sensors could easily be fixed, with, but of course here, mesh would be necessary. Mesh electric would be. So now going into the key point of, of uh, the, the initial motivation of this work, which was really studying the effect of induced motion at sensor interface. And so to reiterate, the motion artifacts are particularly problematic in wearable health monitoring, especially since misdiagnosis to these artifacts can substantially reduce quality of life for patients. So we compared the effect of induced motion on these sensors the, in, with a couple of tests. So the first tests involve uh, actually deforming the skin around the sensors while recording signals. Since ECG signals have a very distinct waveform, they serve as a good signal for determining if the artifact is uh, manifested from the motion. So clearly, uh, stretching, uh, pressing the sensor, and releasing the deformation uh, had no effect on ECG waveform recorded with the DOS sensors, whereas the others are uh, clearly affected. When we calculate the signal to noise ratio, accounting for these artifacts, we found that the, um, the overall SNR for the drawn on skin sensors, gel electrodes, mesh electrodes, effectively 20 and 12 decibels, which clearly shows the motion artifacts can substantially affect the SNR. Another uh, point to consider when it comes to uh, skin deformation induced motion at the electrolyte site is a potential change in electrode impedance, uh, since they also have been associated with artifacts. And during all of these deformations, there was no uh, statistically significant difference between average change into electrode impedance across sensors and the gel electrodes. And these data kind of indicate that the DOS EP sensors and gel electrodes were uh, that the change in electrode impedance rather was not a contributor to the slide. Furthermore, uh, impedance changes on the surface of the DOS EP stretching increasing on human skin were obtained, and the change in impedance during the deformations was minimal for various measurement frequency relevant signal monitoring, which makes the DOS EP well suited for reporting biological signals in the presence of skin deformation. So we talked about two tests that we did, uh, second test, where we investigated another mode of induced motion, 
by attaching a vibrating motor nearby the sensors to kind of simulate shaking of the arm. Um, here we recorded the resting muscle activity sites uh, while a vibrating motor was turned on and off. That's one portion is represented by these uh, pink bars. So in these time domain signals, DOS EP sensors and gel electrodes don't show much of a difference, whereas uh, the mesh electrodes are substantially affected. But these time frequency maps reveal something very interesting. Starting at the bottom here, um, the mesh electrodes were directly impacted by the vibration, by the green color near one kilohertz time. Although the vibration was set to one kilohertz, we see substantial presence of lower uh, frequency um, between 150 and 500 hertz, particularly during uh, the vibration period. And this lower frequency content is also prevalent among the uh, time frequency map for the gel sensors, which indicates the gel was gel electrodes were actually susceptible to vibration. And of course, the drawn on skin sensors go across the entire spectrum. Now, going on to um, our our next work, and I mainly presented more of our first uh, preliminary work on on drawn on skin bioelectronics, kind of presenting it as a platform. Um, but in a follow-up study, um, we wanted to demonstrate some of the uh, some better approaches to recording data from these sensors. You probably had the question in your mind already that uh, drawing these sensors and, and how do you actually wire them or acquire data from them? Um, I showed earlier that we could use conventional snap connectors, use conductive adhesives with our wireless system to capture data from the DOS sensor directly on skin, drawn directly on the skin. But in this next study, we tried to improve that uh, by developing a better wiring scheme um, using a skin friendly cosmetics material as an later and medical tape encapsulator, uh, we developed these DOS interconnections. And this wiring scheme was just one of the methods applies to patch DOS sensors for our data acquisition. So we did a multiple day EEG test um, showing high, high fidelity recording of the alpha power increasing while a was relaxing, uh, but remained awake. Data shown here are individual time points. Subject wore the sensor for multiple days, but times lab to experiment. Another very critical application of DOS electronics is, is in point of care treatment. So simplicity of DOS bioelectronics uh, drawing process renders it uh, suitable for law, low resource areas. Um, another clear advantage of the platform is that it can be customized to any arbitrary shape and size. So let's uh, consider the case of a soldier on the battlefield. Uh, soldiers frequently experience uh, skin wounds from shrapnel. To mimic this scenario, we used a mass skin wound model and applied electrical stimulation through DOS electrodes. This resulted in a wound size that was more than two times smaller than the side of the wound. Uh, from the top versus the bottom side of the wound. In addition to customizing treatments, uh, we also sought to expand our mapping capabilities, uh, making DOS sensors and arrangements unique to the anatomy of individual subjects in situ. So usually uh, researchers and clinicians will follow a process in which the electrodes are repositioned, sort of a trial and error manner, perform iterative measurements of muscle activity, and identify the active sites. This is particularly useful in the case of EMPT patients where they may have a missing limb and uh, the, the uh, Research or clinician is trying to determine what are the remnants of the muscle that are functioning, eventually to help develop a prosthetic sort of functionality of that limb. Um, the typical sensing devices used for this type of test are in the form of thin film based multi electrode arrays or MEA. Um, and the need for custom DOS MEA arises from the limitations of conventional MEA uh, used for what is typically referred to as surface high density. And uh, the limitation of these MEAs is that they're fixed indiscriminate construction uh, with respect to muscle anatomy, unique muscle anatomy of subjects leads to missing relevant muscle activity, highly redundant data, uh, complicated electrode optimization procedures, and accuracies in prosthetic control. So DOS MEAs are actually reconfigurable on the skin. So after their full design might be fabricated on the skin, there would be no need to modify the position 
higher amine for the few electrodes. Instead, the user can simply draw or erase positions to localize or centralize the muscle activity. So here on the left side, we show the fabrication process. Um, and on the right side, you can see customized DOS ME at various scales over tens of centimeters. Uh, a large muscle back, a smaller muscle arms like the biceps, triceps, flex muscle face like psychomaticus. So seeing all these arrays, um, you may have noticed that the acquisition of data might become a little bit more cumbersome or complex, but not to worry, not to worry we developed a few different strategies uh, depending on need and context. So the first two cases here, number one and two, uh, involve uh, the situation in which the initial MEA design may not be known. So for the first case, the electrodes may be very dense and spaced together, and drawing interconnections may be tricky. In this case, using design, but you have space to draw interconnections, but the wiring can be done further away from the array using insulation and encapsulation below, which we further improved on. And lastly, this final case involves having a known initial MEA. So in this particular case, fabricated an interconnection film, collected data via an carpet connective film cable. So as previously, we had not reported DOS MEAs. We wanted to compare against existing MEA technologies, considering both the conventional flex flexible Grids here at the bottom, and uh, wearable bioelectronics based on uh, local microfabrication, also based on uh, of uh, intrinsic material. So DOS MEAs here, what we can see is, despite being fully handmade, they show uniformity uh, and very comparable in the range of relevant uh, frequency. Uh, in addition, look at the use of motion artifacts, particularly in the case of flexing or stationary group of muscles, for example, flexors on the forearm, stretch the skin during flexion, we observe that there's no uh, artifacts during these similar periods of stretching, pressing, and releasing. Whereas in other cases, structurally engineered mesh electrodes and stretchable printed electrodes, uh, they're clearly still susceptible to motion. Now, the last point here is that the FPC grid actually shows no artifacts uh, in this test, but it should be noted that they have extra adhesive layers. And after a few hours of wearing, not as strong as eventually with artifacts. So in high density formats, um, DOS MEAs are also capable of providing some critical neuromuscular information. Um, here, we identified motor unit activity, uh, propagation of even localized inhibition zones forming an inhibition base. These are particularly important because they essentially help us to identify um, what are referred to as target sites for, say, Botox injections, injections um, to treat diseases such as dystonia or spasticity or other movement disorders. Um, so here you can see the actual propagation of particular row of when we take this first row and we out like this keep this for all of the different rows of the end, identify individual inner zones uh, in each of these rows of course identify band wrist form flexors um, at the bottom here we show a comparison of the signal quality during large muscle specifically comparing the dos ME uh, against the FPC grid during resistance band uh, bicep curls. You can imagine that there's this large muscle movement, large muscle shifting beneath uh, the MEA. And over time, you can observe the change in signal quality, and it happens rather quickly that within the course of the minutes, um, the bottom rows, particularly, which experience a lot of uh, deformation due to muscle movement beneath, begin to lose contact with the skin and eventually.
So here we uh, try to emphasize the reconfigurability aspect of drawn and scanner uh, after fabricating most of the array. And what you see here is uh, a few different arrangements of these DOSM relative to FPC grid at a fixed position. Um, and we shift the DOSM relative flexors. So in the top arrangement, we're looking at the orientation of, or rather we're looking at the arrangement of DOSME placed in medial and lateral form, essentially covering more of the circumference of the form. But what you can see from these uh, activation maps here for these different gestures that we miss some activity. Notice that there's more activity kind of going up towards a uh, distal down the forearm. Um, so considering this aspect, we decided to reconfigure um, the of the endosomy relative to the grid. So in the second arrangement, you can start to see uh, a little bit more of that distal activity, uh, or activity in the direction rather, back towards the wrist. Um, but it still seems that there's some data that are missed in all of these maps. And when we finally look at arrangement three, you can still you can see that we can better centralize the activity of uh, the muscles that are active during these particular gestures. So one of them could use uh, for improvement. Now, through these various arrangements, the reconfigurability of these dosami illustrates the ease of revealing further spatial information, which better evaluate the functional both healthy patient without greatly increasing redundancy. So in the last part of this work, um, we made subject-specific uh, MEA, DOS MEAs, which had 32 channels to cover the circumference of the forearm, um, different stencils, match the circumference for each particular subject. We compared the EMG data while recording various different gestures. We're shown on the last slide, adding that opposite of deflection extension here. And we compared this data to that of two FPC grids, so 64 channel grids, so 128 channel, covering roughly the same area around the circumference of the forearm. So Below, we uh, show here the RMS voltage spatial maps um, showing activation for the different gestures. Um, classification accuracy here, front of the right, uh, for the EMG recorded with the DOS MEA uh, for this representative subject is quite high compared with to that of the FPC. And the feature separability from principal component analysis also explains why this is data from the DOS MEA far more distinguishable. Uh, so less redundant out of the, and the subject was able to control a robotic hand real time. With that said, um, we've uh, kind of tried to overview the, the DOS Polytronics platform uh, this talk, um, kind of covering all of the publications have so far. Um, but I want to kind of conclude on, on the last point, that is that inks, the pens, and the pencils that we use serve as a toolkit for easy construction of various customizable DOS electronics on textured skins. Um, of course, I've mentioned several advantages here, but of course I want to emphasize as well the immunity to motion artifacts is enhancement for bioelectronics. And it does suggest the ability of DOS electronics, especially in areas. And of course, with future development, further optimization of functional ink materials, developing more functional ink, but increasing the library of materials. Um, improving some of the device performance, eventually implementing fully wireless readout capability. Uh, we envision DOS by electronics as a promising personalized healthcare team. The last thing I'd like to do is acknowledge uh, my colleagues, um, Dr. Yu, of course, our collaborators at various institutions um, over the years helping us work. Of course, our funding sources as well. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your time. I've uh, put up your codes here for our publication. In case you're interested in learning more, of course, I'm open to Thank you very much. Hi, thank you, Hakim. That's a very nice talk. Thank you. So, can you uh, stop your screen share? So share my screen again. No, uh, I will start the panel discussion.
uh, we have two panelists. Uh, one is uh, Yan Wang from the University of Electronic Science and the Technology of China. Uh, next one is uh, Mendy Han that I uh, previously introduced. He's a uh, uh, IP from the Peking University. And so uh, that's already one question from the audience. So uh, I will start from that. And uh, this is for uh, visit. Uh, the question is, uh, how about the structure integrity? Uh, I mean, the mechanical properties after application using the D, uh, the, the technique you mentioned, the DWG. So the question is about the uh, mechanical properties of the scaffold, yeah. right? Yeah. After fabrication. So it's yeah. um, with PCL, it's really uh, um, the property, mechanical properties are very nice because uh, even if the thickness of the scaffold is of about uh, 100 micron, uh, we can really uh, handle it, uh, even stretch it with hands. It's possible. If you, if you do it gently, you can just deform reversibly uh, the, the, the material, the scaffold. So they are quite good, I would say. Uh, we do not uh, meet any issue regarding the mechanical properties. Oh, that's that's great. And so, uh, do you, do we have any questions from our panelist about the uh, Mendy? Yeah. yeah. Hi. Um, hi. Uh, can, can I ask a question first? Hi. Hi, Vincent. Very nice talk. Um, so I have a question on the tissue regeneration. So uh, by reading the literature, I was aware that some electrical stimulation or mechanical stimulation can also accelerate the regeneration of some tissues like nerve or bone. So will that also promote the regeneration of periodontal regeneration, like, like your application? Uh, so, and so, for your technique, can you also use electro spinning to make piezoelectric uh, scaffold? So, pie piezoelectric scaffolds or electro spin uh, piezoelectric uh, materials have already been demonstrated, yes, in the literature with a random uh, orientation of the filaments. Um, and I also, I think, saw something regarding the precise, precise uh, deposition of piezoelectric materials using this, this um, combination between electrospinning and 3D printing. Um, regarding uh, the dental application, I'm not sure that uh, an electrical uh, stimulation could help to regenerate uh, faster uh, the tissues we, we were working on. Um, but you're right, uh, for neurons, for instance, or uh, it, um, what's the name also of oh, car cardiocytes for the cells for a heart. Uh, of course, there is a, an interest, but uh, I'm not working on these tissues. But yes, you're right, there is a, a huge uh, interest to study electrostimulation um, of cardi cardiomyocytes and also. Uh, neurons, uh, um, uh, neurons which are present in muscles, and yes, different kinds of cells which are actually using uh, actuation, yes, electrical actuation. Okay, th thank you. I have another question on the scaffold. I think the scaffold is very thin and soft, right? It's very low stiffness, and you print it on a carrying substrate. And I think you mentioned that you can detach it from the substrate. So how to detach the very soft scaffold from the substrate? And during the process, will it experience very severe deformations? So that's the question. How to detach so, the scaffold from the yeah. substrate? So, um, so it depends on the on the substrate uh, on which you are printing but uh, uh, even if it's a glass or uh, silicon wafer like i think i showed the, the video with the silicon wafer on the stage of the printer 
So usually it's quite easy if you just use um, uh, a solution which has a, a surface tension which is lower than water. So actually, if you use ethanol, for instance, you can detach the samples quite easily from the surface. I see. So, so, so the adhesion between the polymer and the substrate is, is quite low, right? The adhesion, so uh, strong it, adhesion. Uh, it's not so low. Um, well, it depends. If you just if you take tweezers and you want to detach it, uh, yes, of course you will succeed. But um, sometimes it's very hard to detach. So, depending on the on the thickness. And also, of depending on the time of printing, uh, so yes, it could it could be uh, easy to detach when you print very thick tissues, uh, thick scaffolds. Sorry, but uh, if they are very thin, no, they don't detach very easily. If you don't use ethanol, for instance, yes, I see. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Do you have any questions for Martin? Yeah, well. yes. yeah, I um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Seals and uh, El, uh, El Shed. And uh, I, it's very impressive uh, presentation, and I have a, a couple of questions uh, for you. And uh, I wonder, um, you have uh, dental applications, and do you have uh, uh, test the biocompatibility? And if you have already tested the um, biocompatibility, um, is, is it possible to, um, uh, to, to apply the scaffold into the bone or something else, uh, application sort of? Uh, this is, um, the first question. Uh, maybe we, but one, one, one point to point. So just the, um, uh, to the first question. <laughs> so the, the question is addressed to me, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, okay. Frederick Seals. Uh, so uh, actually, we didn't do any in vivo experimental assay, um, but this is the next step of the project. So the, 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 this first project was just founded for uh, the preliminary uh, study. Uh, so in vitro study, but this is the next step. We would like to make uh, maybe to go beyond uh, to go toward the medical applications. So to make some uh, in vivo tests, but uh, we don't uh, we didn't uh, perform these tests during the the project I presented to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. And the last questions. Um, you uh, you use uh, electrode spinning uh, in your uh, lab. Uh, I, I wonder the most uh, smallest uh, ship uh, could you uh, ma manufactured uh, in this um, uh, in this kind of uh, um, method? Uh, how much of this size? So the smallest object we can print. Yeah, how many? Uh, the most uh, smallest object you mentioned is a 100 micrometer or so uh, uh, I don't remember this uh, value so this, in terms of size of the object we usually we are usually interested in making large areas because afterwards we can cut them and uh, make several mm -hmm. samples or we can also print several parts on the same substrate but uh, mm -hmm. So uh, I would say it depends on the on the design, but uh, we we can do things at the millimeter scale in the in terms of width. Um, yes. So after afterwards, you have to detach and to handle uh, the object. So even if the uh, the the how to say the surface you want to use uh, you you are interested in is very small, you can even print um, larger areas around in order to handle uh, the device. So the smallest, the smallest um, surface of interest we can print is, uh, yes, of about uh, 100 or a few hundreds of micrometers, I would say. 
and then mm. uh, we can uh, maybe print larger areas because the idea is always to handle to be able to handle the, the scaffold except Thank if you, you just much. want to print it and then you don't want to okay. touch it anymore yes Thank you. Thank you, Professor Liao. And uh, uh, Professor El uh, uh, I just uh, um, feared you um, you mentioned the three um, arrangement uh, in your um, slides. And uh, you mentioned that you have a different arrangement and have a different uh, result. I just wonder, uh, is, the, uh, is the three different arrangement have uh, uh, different uh, um, number of sensors or the point of, of these uh, sensors uh, uh, is different. So in all of those cases, each arrangement has the exact same number of sensors. So all we're doing is we actually shifted the arrays, the drawn on skin MEA relative to the fixed grid. So we have the conventional one as kind of like our fixed reference point, And we had around uh, two two by eight arrays side by side or above and below mm. or together all above because of how we noticed the pattern of activity was different based on the previous arrangement. So ideally, actually, in that particular case, I think you I mentioned that three of those gestures are covered very well. You can see the center of the muscle activity very clearly, but one of them not so clearly. But if we were to again optimize the arrangement, we might combine a com we may have a combination of both going in the distal direction towards the wrist, and also some electrodes going more uh, lateral, uh, covering the circumference of. So all of them did have the same number of sensors. It's the main point is that the arrangement is what was important. Um. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. And a lot of questions. You mentioned that you'll use. Um, um, polymer um, pedals, I think, and uh, you use it as uh, in uh, one of the materials of the ink, uh, the, the conduct uh, ink. And uh, I just, uh, I think this um, polymer um, pedals uh, is affected uh, um, not only by the um, temperature, moisture, but also the pressures. So, how could you control these uh, things? Um, make it stead, uh, st stable. So uh, I guess you're referring to the P dot PSS within the conductive ink, the organic conducting mm -hmm. polymer, right? So in this case, yes. uh, we had a, a combination of two materials, right? We we have P dot PSS and we have silver flakes. And actually, within this ink, uh, the silver flake uh, weight percentage is substantially larger than that of the P dot PSS. Um, hence, why the ink is so conductive. Um, to help prevent uh, issues with stability, especially with the organic conducting polymer, we might prevent some of the exposure to the air a little bit by at least encapsulating the, the overall material. So we showed a few different encapsulation uh, approaches, uh, conventional medical tape, or um, for example, you use wood bandage, which is also another one. That we but those are a couple of approaches and we could try to of the material. Mm -hmm. Granted, we have only looked at um, the ink performance in relatively short term, like three days. So within that time period, uh, the material is stable for particularly electrophysiological applications. Thank you, Ashid. And I learned a lot from your presentation. Thank you very much. Sure. Hi, hi, Kim. Actually, I have some questions to follow uh, Yan. So uh, you use a um, multiple electrode for the DMG test, right? Right. But you use connected with the wires. So I'm I'm wondering how you animate always moving with when you're using so much wires around. Yes. So, yeah. That's a great question. Great question. So <laughs> now a good point is uh, I try to focus mainly on the device skin interface when it comes to motion artifact issue. Now, cable movement is another uh, motion mm -hmm. artifact issue. The cable movement will definitely be a problem. Um, in this particular case, where we have the MEA, pretty much all of the experiments mm -hmm. were done in a stationary manner. So we were not actually moving uh, the subject, or the subject was not moving during the experiments. In other words, they were not walking or carrying or hanging the wires. So in this case, we didn't have to worry too much about that. But of course, it would be much better if we can eventually develop a 
fully wireless readout where we developed the wiring system fully based on the ink on the skin's surface and eventually have a circuit to interface directly with that. <laughs> yeah, I think you should try it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So the, the last question is, uh, you know, for a commercial product, it's very important to have a very good uniformity. So for your source, that is it's very good. Just the paint on your skin, uh, on your biological tissues, but how you control the uniformity? That I think. Yeah, yeah I this is a great it. point. Yeah, great point. Again, very good question. Um, right now the. The applications that we've limited the drawn skin ink to, particularly the conductive ink, um, it hasn't required a substantial amount uh, amount of control in the deposition process or the timing. For example, like if we are taking, you know, maybe uh, a few seconds to draw an electrode versus like tens of seconds to draw an electrode, of course, there will be a difference in the conductivity of the material. But for example, in the case of electrophysiological sensing, key parameter is really skin to electrode impedance. And when you consider the difference in the conductivity, how much of a difference does it truly make in electrophysiological signal uh, recording perspective? Not much, because the skin to electrode impedance in general is very large, right? Order of uh, 10 to the 6 ohms, mega ohms, right? Whereas the conductivity of the material is on the order of ohms, milliohms. Changes are very minute relative to the true magnitude of the actual impedance of the but when you're talking about, for example, transistors, um, and very important to control the, the thickness uh, of the materials and how you're de depositing them. So standardizing uh, the tools is necessary. So developing a better pen technology or uh, tuning the material properties and flow so that we can get uniform deposit materials um, would be very important. That's kind of also something we're planning on doing, improving the pen and deposition technology Fabrication technology essentially helped me the procedure more uniform whenever we device. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Thank you for your answering. I think your group has a lot of experience on how to pattern these devices. <laughs> <laughs> um, and hello, we think uh, I also have one question to you. So, uh, what's the video you shoot is, is very cool, actually, it's impressed me a lot. So am I wondering just if I have, actually, I have an electrical spinning equipment in my lab. So if I want to change it to DWE, how can I do that? <laughs> um, you can try with a conventional 3D printer uh, to combine them. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, what you really have to do is to control the speed of the stage and uh, so relatively to the speed of the head so it depends on if the head is moving also or not uh, so because in what I've shown um, um, maybe the speeds I've used uh, were we have used were of about tens of centimeters per second mm -hmm. So it's quite fast. So if you consider the acceleration and deceleration, uh, you have to use robust motors uh, for the printer. And um, one other thing is that uh, two other things. The first one is uh, you really have to control the humidity if you really want to reproduce uh, quite easily <laughs> your experiments. And the second one is you also have to control uh, with a high accuracy, the feed rate of the, the polymer um, coming from the nozzle, because it's all, also very uh, uh, a strong issue. If you if you have a, just a syringe pump with a normal, uh, let's say, uh, normal parameters uh, like uh, you can find in the medical uh, field, maybe you can meet some issues because you will have some depths. Uh, between uh, so you will have some motor steps so it, it can have an impact on the quality of the jetting but uh, so except that you can you can start in your lab with a uh, just a conventional 3d printer and uh, it can give you some good results i started like this uh, maybe maybe not 10 years ago but uh, so far from 10 years ago <laughs> okay okay 
it's, it seems very complicated to change uh, electrical spinning to DWB here, but it's much easier to change a 3D printer to DWB. <laughs> <laughs> you can so try. I, actually, I bought, uh, bought the wrong product. <laughs> Andy, do you have uh, some questions for uh, Yeah, yeah, I have a few questions for him. So the first question is also related to the wires connected to the electrode that you draw on skin. So it's a very fantastic idea to directly draw the electrophysiological sensor on the skin to avoid the motion artifact. But you know, your sensor is quite soft, right? But the wires, uh, even though you use very thin wires, but it's also uh, more rigid compared with your softer sensor. So the interface between the sensor and the wire, uh, that's my question. I was wondering the, uh, I was wondering about the stability or the mechanical stability of the interface between the skin, uh, between the electrode that you draw on the skin and the wires that you connect it directly on the electrode. Got it. Okay, so the question about stability. Um, so we had a few different uh, cases for wiring, right? We have some uh, mm -hmm. adhesives that can help secure the wire directly on top of the electrode. We also have some other uh, ways we can, for example, like interconnection films, adhesives to uh, interface with the wires, uh, with the interconnections on the skin. Now, um, in terms of mechanical stability, this is a great point. This is something we also have to optimize. But um, the way that we've tried to, uh, the best way I think that we've tried to embed the wires on neuron sensors is actually by using soft uh, kind of rubbery composites. We use a conductive wire glue that we can embed and fix the wires in. We uh, we haven't done the actual mechanical test for this yet, but they have pretty strong uh, uh, adhesion, and so they can trap the wires. Even if you slightly tug with your finger, the wires will still remain packed and on connected to the electrode. Um, but that is something we still have to investigate further. And, and to be honest, again, we're rather transitioning away from using um, physical wires, and eventually we plan to make the interface fully on the skin with contact pads from, for example, like a wireless data acquisition so that we entirely remove the, the need for wires, physical uh, long wires. Yeah. I see, I see. Uh, another question is, uh, I think you mainly draw the sensors on the skin, uh, which is a dry surface. So is it possible to draw the sensor on organs where there is biofluid and the surface is wet? So we have tried this before, and uh, we had some degree of success. Um, we haven't published the results yet, but um, we have been able to draw on, for example, like a like freshly harvested heart, uh, porcine mm -hmm. heart. It is possible to draw on it, but it is important to note that the material composition definitely plays a role here. Our conductive ink is water-based, um, and so whenever we're applying it on you know, a saline-covered surface, it can definitely dilute it. and uh, the Connectivity of the ink, of course, will go down because of that dilution. But um, that is something we also have to consider: some alternative ink formulations, which can be better suited to the uh, wet tissue adhesion. Mm, I see. That's very cool. I think, as you mentioned before, for electrophysiological sensing, the conductivity of the ink is not that important because compared with the impedance, it's quite small. So I think it's a very cool. Uh, work to directly draw the sensors on the organs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, actually, I think of an idea. So, can we use the the uh, the DWG yeah, the DWG technique to directly print uh, this uh, US lecture on wet tissues? <laughs> Interesting idea. <laughs> I wonder. So, you guys can complete. <laughs> Actually, I read a paper published in Nature Electronics. So they use 3D printing hydrogels, uh, conductive hydrogels. So it can connect the wet tissues very well. So I think the DWH is also a very good technique to do that job. Okay. It's not that, it's not dangerous uh, for the body. You can 
you can be uh, how to say uh, submitted to you can submit your skin to electric field using electro spinning because the voltage is very high but the current is very low so there is no danger actually so yeah you you can print on your skin <laughs> <laughs> so and that's very good session today so, so but i'm uh, very sorry we i want to end this session and uh, with two certificate and uh, this two certificate is good to both CB, uh both speakers for their uh wonderful talks and thank you very much thank you very much thank see you, you. Much. thank you thank you see you, you. bye-bye不再是奇迹，不再是幻想，此刻正感觉全世界离我鼓掌。不必太在意身旁近期的目光，可以点点头，可以放声歌唱。我创造奇迹，我拥有梦想，我希望看见所有骄傲的脸庞。再为曾经失败放弃或感伤，努力才是真的方向。I can, I can， 没有什么可以阻挡心中无限的力量。I can, I can， 你也能够像我一样飞。